give a really brief intro to the program and really talk about three different ways to get involved with the program. So I'll go through how to become a sponsor, a site, and then really I think more importantly for this group are to be partners for the summer program. So just as a really quick intro, uh, the summer program is a child nutrition program and it's administered at the federal level through the United States Department of Agriculture through Food and Nutrition Services Office. And then at the state level, it's administered through um, our office, the Colorado Department of Education, the Office of School Nutrition. And then locally, the program is operated by sponsors of the program who take on the administration and the financial piece of the program and then supervise sites. And the sites are where the meals are actually provided to kids. So um, the Summer Food Service Program was established to help fill the gap because we know that uh, during the summer, a lot of kids don't have access to the school lunch or school breakfast program. So the sponsors of the program were able to serve meals at sites to any child 18 years of age and, and under, and they'll receive a free meal. Uh, last summer, we served over 1.5 million meals throughout Colorado. We had 548 sites and 80 sponsors. Um, we're anticipating pretty big growth this year, so I would say that our site numbers will probably be uh, close to 600 or more. And with that, we hope we serve more meals and reach more kids. So just um, briefly, the role of our office is to conduct sponsor training on the program regulations and requirements. We approve the sponsors to participate in the program as well as the sites that are approved. And then our office uh, monitors and reviews program uh, operations. So we do go out to the site. We provide any needed technical assistance as well. And then lastly, our office processes those program payments for reimbursement. Uh, sponsors can be uh, many different types of organizations. So they can be public or private nonprofit schools. They can be units of government, private nonprofit organizations. Uh, they can also be residential or non-residential camps. And then uh, universities or colleges and community and faith-based organizations. So we do have a wide range of sponsors that operate the program in Colorado. In order to, to sponsor the program, a sponsor does need to be able to demonstrate financial and administrative capability. They oversee food service operations and conduct a nonprofit food service. And then sponsors do need to attend an annual training uh, that our office provides. And then as an approved sponsor, uh, they enter into a written agreement with our office and then provide the training to the site staff who are providing those meals to the kids. Then they also need to go and monitor their sites just to ensure program compliance in the field and then submit claims to our office. So when we talk about sites, this is kind of the second way to get involved in the program if sponsorship is a little bit outside of the realm of what you're capable of. And sites can really be any place that kids naturally congregate during the summer. So these are some of our common types of sites. We have schools, churches, rec centers, uh, libraries and museums, pools are really great, apartment complexes, mobile home parks and boys and girls clubs. Um, some new things that we're uh, experiencing this year will be more sites at farmers markets as well as we have a hospital site that's coming on board so it'll be interesting to see how that works and hopefully we can expand in that direction. Another big thing in Colorado is mobile feeding. I think we've all talked about um, challenges in rural locations and finding where those kids are and mobile feeding is great for apartment complexes and places where the kids aren't coming out to other locations but you can bring the food to them. There are eligibility requirements for sites and so um, it's really important that you're not only determining where there's a need in your community for a site to be located but that it is eligible to participate and so the three main types of sites are open, which means that any child in the community can come to your site. Closed enrolled, where your program, you might have a specific program going on and then just those kids enrolled receive meals, or a camp site. 
And so for open and closed enrolled sites, they're located in areas where at least 50% of the kids living in that area are eligible for free or reduced price school meals. And then camps, um, the eligibility is based on household income applications, and the sponsors of camps are reimbursed for the meals serve just the kids that do qualify for free or reduced price meals. Um, we do have a really great resource to help you determine site eligibility, and you can find that on that link on this slide. And then there are meal service requirements at sites. So open and closed enrolled sites can serve up to two meals each day. Um, unfortunately, one of the regulations is that lunch and supper cannot be served on the same day but you could serve a breakfast and a lunch, a lunch and a snack, or a combination of that. Campsites are able to serve up to three meals each day. And then sites uh, work with their sponsors and determine when they will serve the meals, so we really encourage you to uh, have meal service times that are appropriate to the kids that you're serving. Um, for instance, if you're primarily serving teenagers, they might not be as receptive to a breakfast at 8 a.m., but 10 o'clock might work. So, Meal service times are really flexible. Um, staff on site do need to make sure that the meals are eaten at the site. So with the summer program, meals aren't able to be taken off of the site. And then site staff needs to complete a daily meal count form, so they're tracking the number of meals that are being given to the kids. And then adhere to local health and sanitation regulations and ensure civil rights requirements are followed. With the summer program, there are specific meal pattern requirements that um, are specific to breakfast, lunch and supper, and then snack. And sponsors of the program have a few different ways to provide meals to the sites. So the sites can either prepare meals at their facility. Uh, the sponsor can contract with a school food authority who could then provide meals to the sites, or they can contract with a registered vendor with our office. So here, in a really tiny nutshell, is the meal pattern. Um, there are four components that the meals <coughs> consist of. So we have a milk, fruit vegetable, grains, and meat meat alternates. The link on this slide, if you're interested in what those meal pattern requirements look like in more depth, um, that's a great resource we have. Um, we're really focusing on the nutritional quality of meals this summer. So we know that when we're looking at increasing participation, the type of meals provided do really impact that. Through uh, surveys that we've done in the past with our sponsors, we've found that if you're able to provide a hot meal at the site, attendance does increase. Mm -hmm. Or if you can do um, cold meals, but they have really fresh ingredients, same with your hot meals, versus like a shelf-stable meal. <coughs> So site monitoring, uh, I mentioned this briefly earlier, sponsors do go out and conduct this monitoring at their sites. So for new sites that don't participate in other child nutrition programs, they receive a site visit during the first week. And then all sites are reviewed during the first four weeks of operation by their sponsor. An ethnic racial data form is also completed at the site and that's for USDA statistical um, reporting and just Again, ensuring that there is no non-discrimination, or there is no discrimination, I should say. Um, and so monitoring does need to be documented. If the sponsor participates in the child and adult care food program, then we do have some additional monitoring flexibilities. So this slide is, um, I won't really go over this in too much detail, but with any federal program, there are specific records that do need to be kept on file, so this outlines some of those. Um, probably for those of you that are working on increasing access and expansion, um, the biggest one will be that daily meal count form. So uh, we just want to be sure that those are accurate and then that's what you'll be reporting your number on. So uh, the sponsor is reimbursed based on the formula uh, meals times a rate. And the rate is established annually by USDA, and then you multiply that times the number of kids you're expecting to serve. And that really is the framework for a sponsor's budget. Um, claims are submitted to our office within 60 days after the last day the sponsor operates each month. 
And then the summer program reimbursement can be used for the nonprofit food service of the summer program or if you participate. And right when it's really cold, you can start thinking about summer for the next year. And then in March of each year, we have our sponsor training. So that's early March. Uh, returning sponsors have a webinar option. And then new sponsors, we do have an in-person training that's required. The application for participation is due by April 15th for new sponsors and then May 1st for returning sponsors. And our webpage is updated frequently, but every January it's updated to reflect what's going on for the next summer. So this third way to get involved with the program is really probably what speaks most uh, to all of you, and it's really becoming a partner to the program. So we have, um, did that one not get in there? I, I skipped a slide, so I'll just I'll just talk to you guys about it. Um, really making families aware that this program is available to them. That's a really key thing. We're working on making sure that we're not only expanding the program, but we're we're making sure that families are aware of the resource. So anytime that you can put information in your newsletter, um, through your social media, your web page, however you can get this information out to families is really fantastic. We do have a couple of um, ways that families can find sites near them, and it's kidsfoodfinder.org, or they can text food to 877-877, and that's also available in Spanish, so they could text comida to 877-877. Um, I encourage you to collaborate with a site or a sponsor. So um, some things we've heard as barriers include transportation, so if anyone's able to either transport food to the site or kids to the site, that's always helpful. Um, you can help serve the food, conduct outreach, um, a lot of different ways you can collaborate with the site or the sponsor. And then we've also seen that sites that offer activities with the meal service do have an increase in participation. So if you're able to provide any sort of activity to the site, you know, it can range from a reading uh, club to a recreational sport, you know, really whatever you're able to offer and change that up for the kids. Um, and then working with schools, advocates, and elected officials is a really great way to just help, again, create that community involvement and a sustainable program. Um, some really great things that I've been seeing happening uh, last summer and I, I know moving into this summer will be more mobile pantries at summer sites. So if you have access to um, partnering with your sponsor site to provide that service, that is fantastic. Um, also, you know, nutrition education is really key. And even if you have something geared toward the parents, so the parents are involved in something while the kids are eating, that's also great. Um, this summer, we uh, there's a national agreement in place with AmeriCorps Vista. So I think volunteers are always needed. and. That will be a really great resource. We hope to get VISTA volunteers out to Colorado this year. Um, and then we have a lot of different outreach templates and tools on our webpage. So um, definitely don't feel like you have to recreate the wheel. We'll have a postcard template that you can just print off and send to families or put in with their groceries, different things like that. Um, and then our office, since 2000. And 14, we started a statewide marketing campaign, again, just to really increase the awareness of the program. So this year we're expanding that to include movie theater advertisements statewide on AMC theaters. We'll have receipt ads that we'll print in family dollar stores throughout Colorado, and then also partnering with RTD to have bus and light rail advertisements. So any, any type of um, promotion is really fantastic for the program as a partner. So uh, for more information, I've included our summer webpage. We just have a ton of resources, so I do encourage you to go there and explore what we have available. Um, the USDA summer webpage, they have a lot of great toolkits and information as well. And then my contact information is on that slide. So if you have any questions, um, you know, after today, uh, I am a resource for you, and feel free to call or email with any questions or thoughts or collaboration ideas. It's, it's all great. So I, 
I think um, I can take a few questions if anyone has any right now. Could you talk to your balancing, the, your ability to balance two areas together um, in order to meet your 50% free and reduced? Sure, yeah, how, how we did with Westminster. Um, there is some flexibility with the summer program on how we can determine site eligibility. So if a site's located in a census block group where at least all of them are 40% or greater, we can average up to three census block groups to determine a 50% um, eligibility rate. We can also use housing authority information. So if they have income guidelines for that apartment complex, we can use that if, if it's not located in an area eligible location. Mm -hmm. The reimbursement rates this year. Um, so please don't quote me. Um, it's for lunch, three dollars and uh, fifty or sixty cents. I want to say we have a reimbursement um, handout on the website, but it's usually there is a little bit higher reimbursement for sites that prepare meals on site versus sites that are uh, being vetted. So can you remind me, I'm sorry, Mark was talking to me, so um, <laughs> can you remind me the website and the, the text of where, pe where people go to find the location? Amy, do you mind writing it on that easel right there? Yeah, do you mind sorry, repeating I, that? I left out that slide. Um, so the website is kidsfoodfinder.org. Kidsfoodfinder .org. Okay. And then the text line is 877-877, and you can text food or Comida. And that messaging is on all of the materials that we have for our advertising campaign, as well as the materials we'll have available on our webpage for, for you all to utilize. Would you say the web address again? Kids Food Finder dot org. Thank you. Do you collect data about where those texts are coming in from in order to have a subjective view of maybe where these programs are coming from? Yeah, great question. Um, that text line, so these are, uh, the text line is the national hotline, and so they do collect that information. And at the end of the summer, then I request that information to see where, you know, we're getting a lot of calls or texts from. So I can share that information with sponsors if people are interested. I also, I think this is probably a total breach of confidentiality, but do you collect the phone numbers and then we can outreach and market to the <laughs> phone <laughs> 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 But I can imagine you can't give those cell phone numbers. <laughs> I don't believe so. Whenever I've requested that information from USDA, I just get a blanket number and location. And then the kidsfoodfinder.org, um, that map is also populated by the USDA's Summer Food Rocks map, but that is the local Colorado link, so it does go to a page that Hunger Free Colorado is hosting, and then the, the local hotline number is on that webpage as well. So we get information on hotlines from the Colorado and then the Sure, yeah, so the question Can you repeat is... repeat that question, I'm sorry. Yeah, the question is around adults coming to the summer sites and if they can receive meals. And while the program is intended for kids 18 and under, sponsors are able to provide adult meals and they can charge the full cost of the meal or they can use other funding sources to cover the cost of adult meals. And we've seen that... Um, depending on the site, adult meals can be really helpful to increase participation because you're encouraging that family setting right. for everyone to come and, and have a meal. 